Welcome back to Startups for the Rest of Us. I'm Rob Walling. Today, I sit down with Cortland and Channing Allen, the co-founders of Indie Hackers, to talk about their newfound independence. They are no longer owned by Stripe. They also turned the tables on me in this interview, and we spend probably the first 30 minutes talking about my new book, as well as sharing theories about entrepreneurship and just all the tasty goodness that comes when I sit down with really smart people who are thinking about entrepreneurship on a day-to-day basis. This episode will go live in both of our podcast feeds. If you haven't checked out the Indie Hackers podcast, you definitely should. It's a great companion podcast to Startups for the Rest of Us. But if this episode feels like a kind of a cross between an episode of Startups for the Rest of Us and an episode of Indie Hackers, that's because it is. Because essentially we have all the hosts and we were kind of interviewing one another on the important topics of the day. So we let this intentionally run long. There was just a lot to talk about. To be honest, we hit stop on the recording and talked for another 20 minutes about things that we probably should have recorded. We started talking about AI and about angel investing and a few other things, but that just goes to show you the the content was flowing and it was it was one of those magical moments that you do want to capture. So I know I keep episodes between 30 and 40 minutes typically and this one's a little longer, but I hope you enjoy it and agree that it was worth doing. Before we dive in to the episode, Microconf Mastermind Matching opens on April 3rd. That's just the day after this episode goes live. And realize you can head over now to microconf.com slash masterminds and get on the wait list to be notified. Every time we do mastermind matching, we have people contact us after the deadline closes and begging to be included. And unfortunately, we can't. There's a reason there's a deadline because we start matches. So we only do matching two or three times a year. We have matched more than a thousand founders across dozens of countries, dozens of time zones with a combined ARR somewhere approaching $200 million across all the companies. It's been a very successful offering from MicroConf, one of the most successful offerings we've had in years. We've only been doing it three years, but it has just taken off. And I'd really encourage you to check it out. Whether you are in the idea phase or whether you're doing 10 million ARR, we have a match for you. And we match you up in these small groups of like-minded founders. If you apply between May 3rd and May 12th, which is the deadline, we'll have your match sent by May 17th. In addition, if you're interested in chatting with me at an upcoming MicroConf local, or you have a strategy or a framework that you think other bootstrap SaaS founders should hear, we are always looking for founders to come out and share their expertise during all of our conferences and events. If you're interested, head to microconf.com slash pitches and share your idea with us. And with that, let's dive into my conversation with Cortland and Channing. Anyway, Rob, uh, welcome to the show. We sort of already introduced you in our preamble, and I'm sure anyone who's listened to the show for a while also knows who you are. How you been, man? It's been a while. I've been good. I've been working on microconfs. I'm leaving tomorrow for uh, microconf Denver in the U.S. here, and then I got my, nice. I got my book, my book going. That's my big project nice. I'm heading up right now. Yeah. Wait, yeah. how many microconfs are there? There's Denver. There's Vegas. Yeah. Well, so no, there's not Vegas anymore. There's a U.S. Oh, yeah. Okay. There's a U.S. Microconf, gotcha. and it used to be in Vegas, and then we moved it. It was in Minneapolis last year. It's in Denver this year. Uh, I don't know that we've announced the city for next year, but and then there's a Europe, and those are like our flagship events. And then right. we do the locals, which are the mm-hmm. just like one day, almost afternoon events where we get a big name guest and hang out for a few hours. Channing and I were just talking about like getting back in the game when you've been felt like kind of out mm-hmm. of the game. And I know that we've been out of the game because we haven't been doing microconf in a couple of years. Yeah. Part of that is because of the pandemic. <laughs> but part of that is just like, ah, you know, just out of the game. So next year, Channing, we should bend our company budget to come. Yeah, I was going to ask if you guys were going to make it to, to microconf next week. Not next week, but next year. As soon as we know the city, we'll be there. Because it's been a while and microconf has like so much energy. Also, we're underwater like actually becoming a real business again. So right. <laughs> like, I, feel like, I feel like next year we'll be, we'll, we'll actually like, you know, have the systems and the processes in place where we're running it as opposed to like it is nice to put everything on yeah. stripes tab that's a to, something not, miss. to not burn 10 grand a month yeah, of your go. own money yeah. it's, like, it's like uh-oh <laughs> when, it's, when it's your business it's like yeah i could pay this this could be yeah. my salary you know so you got to be way more judicious with total business life. expenses but microconf of all expenses i think is worth it yeah it'd be great to have you guys back it's been a while yeah it's been so long um you are writing a book or have written a book how far are you in your new book it's called the sas playbook it's all done i it's finished all done. that months ago four or five months yeah it's uh I have a hard copy. 
got some digital print copies. Yeah, wow, it's a hardback, which is like, ooh, that's, a, yeah. that's a beautiful book. Thank you, man. I paid a lot for the design. <laughs> <laughs> this is one, I mean, my first book, Start Small, Stay Small, is a black cover. I don't know if you've seen yeah. it. It's ugly as yeah, hell. Yeah, yeah, I have Because it. I had no budget. No money, designed it myself. <laughs> this one, I was like, all right, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go all out and hire hire a legit designer, a legit layout person. Actual, actually, get an editor this time, and you know, not edit my own work. So, so you, so you put that together your, yourself. I, I'm, I was curious about the publishing process. This is sounds like independently published, and you kind of put together a team of the editor and the. That's right. Designer and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. So this time I hired, a, I didn't remember how much work it was, but I knew it was going to be a lot. So I went and found a book project manager who used to work for a publishing company. Book project Isn't that crazy? manager. crazy? It's very niche. But I was like, I want, I went out just seeking if I can find any type of project manager, I'm sure they can do this. And if they have publishing experience, great. And turns out she had worked for a publisher for three years. So she knew everything. She's like, oh, you can buy 10 ISBNs for the price of two. So you should, you know, just all the little internals. Oh, and I'm, I already know like four different printers in Hong Kong and in the US that I'm going to tell you, you know, is that type of stuff. So it really took a lot of load off, off of me. How much money does it cost to basically do a book right? Self-publishing, you're hiring a book project manager, you're hiring an editor, you're hiring someone to you know, design the, the, the cover to make a video for you on Kickstarter. Like how much all in does it cost to produce a book in 2023? At this point, I bet I'm in 30 grand. 20, 20 okay. to 30 grand for all the labor. That's before right. printing costs or any fulfillment. Wow. Yeah, it's a trip. Right. Okay. And so that's all mostly up front, like to get the thing produced by the different people. And that's then- right. And that doesn't include, you know, obviously I spent a bunch of time writing it and I had a writing coach who was busting my chops. I haven't included her <laughs> in that price because because it's the first book where I've used a writing coach. What is a writing coach? So I want to write a book, not nonfiction, but I'm curious about all the all these details. Yeah, what does a writing coach say to you? Does she just say, write, write more? Yeah, so there's a, they can have a bunch of different roles. If you want to write every word yourself, then you get the writing coach. He or she will be almost a developmental editor where well, it's two things, accountability and developmental editing is really what it Which is. Which is big. Yep. Yeah. So it's like a weekly call. I know that I have to show up with you know mm. X thousand words written. And if you don't, then she was like, so I guess we're going to ship late. And I'm like, oh no, I feel so guilty, you know, <laughs> taking advantage of my guilt complex. So that was, a, accountability was a big thing for me. The second thing was she would just read through and be like, and not even like copy editing, but like, yeah, it's not hanging together. So she'd reorganize pieces, right? And then the third thing for me that I needed was I didn't have time, it's 45,000 words in this book. I didn't have time to write every word, but I have... Literally, I had someone go through and scrape it for an AI project, like close to a million words spoken on my YouTube channel, on my individual podcast episode, you know, just incredible. So I would pick topics and be like, I recorded a whole solo episode around just this topic and I want that to be a section. So she would take that, transcribe it and turn it into a section. So she would write it. She would write the words, but they were my, so you could say she's a ghostwriter, but I always struggle with that because it's all my thoughts. It's your ideas. Yes. Right. And then I would come back and put my voice on it. So she would do it. So that first reminds pass. me. Sorry, go on, go on. No, that was it. So it, it cut a huge amount. In fact, I stalled. I got about halfway through the book. And then I had about a year where I didn't write a word. And that was when I realized I need someone else involved in this because I just can't push it through with the other stuff I'm doing. So there we go. Content reuse and action. It actually yeah. works for books. And I've seen this before too, because I interviewed for my other podcast, James Clear, who wrote Atomic Habits, which was like literally the number one bestseller on Amazon for weeks. And Mark Manson, who wrote The Subtle Art of Not Giving a F***. And they both did the same thing, where instead of, you know, repurposing their podcast, they repurposed their blog posts and then just sort of edited it and put it together in a book. Yep. And that actually works. And it doesn't make the book any worse. It makes the book better because you're picking the best ideas that you've already put out into the world, already tested on an audience. Now you're just putting them in print format where they'll just live forever. That's right. And I did that. So my second book, so I've written four books, right? Start Small, Stay Small. My second book is exactly that. It's a collection of blog posts and it's called Start Marketing the Day You Start Coding. I give that one away for free on my site. Third one I co-wrote with Sherry, Entrepreneur's Guide to Keeping Your Together, and then this one. But the second one is exactly that. It's like my favorite blog post because I had like almost 200 blog posts at one point, essays and such, and compiling that into like a best of was, you know, I still get positive feedback about it. I just had a conversation actually with Josh Kaufman, who wrote The Personal MBA. He's sort of a regular at, at these microconf events. And he specifically mentioned that he's struggling. He's, he's working on a new book. It's going to be a follow-up to Personal MBA. And he's like, well, 
I've got a lot of other stuff, a lot of other balls in the air as well. He's like working on a website where he's going to like have courses and he wants to like keep in touch with his uh, email list. And he's like, yeah, it's kind of hard to figure out a way to work on any of these individual projects. And that idea of like, well, why don't you, you know, figure out the topics? He's still brainstorming for his book. Why don't you figure out the topics that are going to go into your book by testing things out, going out to your email list and like kind of getting information. So it's, it's not just a way to like save time once you decide you want to put the book together, but it's also a useful way to like figure out what goes in the book. And that's something big thing that I did. I mean, I, we really leaned into YouTube about a year ago on, on microconf. And so I've been putting out a YouTube video every week of unique content and it's, it's a, grind. It's a ton of work in addition to the podcast and all that. But the topics that resonated the most there, I was pulling those in to this book and the other the other book that I haven't mentioned to anyone yet that I accidentally wrote that is also 40,000 words. And it's like a prequel <laughs> to this. So now I got to figure out, am I going to publish another book later this year? But it's there's a lot of, uh, a lot of content. Before you came on, we were talking about your accolades. And I was like, Cortland was just going down this long laundry list. And I was like, it's easier just to start from the negative. What hasn't he done? <laughs> and now we get to add to that list that you accidentally wrote a book. What? <laughs> like, what does that even mean? I act- <laughs> yeah, so I had this outline, right? And I'm like, I want to cover everything in this ass playbook. And it's like all the way from like, I don't even have an idea all the way to talking about exits and mindset, you know, the whole life cycle. Mm. So I start at the beginning and I'm writing about ideas and how to come up with them and how to validate and how to evaluate and how to find your first customers and how to, you know, just all that pre-product market fit. And Eventually the book, it was just too damn big. And I realized the weaker part, or maybe not weaker is not the right word, but like the more amorphous part of it, where it's kind of hard to be super prescriptive is everything before product market fit. Because product market fit onward, I, that's what I do every day. I'm in it, right? That's tiny seed. That's a lot of the, you know, the higher end microcom founders. And that's what this has playbook focuses on is at least like some weak product market fit, one to 5K, one to 10K MRR. And like, how do you then go from there? You know, rocket ship it. Everything before that, I had about 25,000 words and I was like, this just doesn't belong here. So I just put it in a Google Doc somewhere. And then when we got done, my writing coach and I got done writing the SAS playbook, she's like, do you want to circle back on this stuff? And I was like, yeah, we could flesh that out. Let's just add it. I think if we had a few thousand words, you know, it'll be, it'll be done. And now it's like 40, 45,000. And so it is, I mean, that's a 210 page book. Right now, the tentative title is Idea to Traction. And I don't know, I don't know what I'll do with it. Maybe I'll publish it later this year, or early next year. Well, you did something with this book that I rarely see and sort of our niche, which is you launched a Kickstarter. Hmm. You're only the second Kickstarter that I've ever backed, like you and one other project in like the last 10 years. And it's crushing it. I mean, you've got like, I think another week to go on the Kickstarter and it's already at $80,000. So it's more than recouped your initial investment. It's basically like you've paid yourself an advance that, you know, an author would have to go beg a publisher for usually, but you've done it through Kickstarter, which is super cool. And I'm wondering like why you did that, because I had just never seen anyone do that. Usually people launch on their email list or they just like, you know, host their own sort of pre-sale. But you've used like this platform that is super popular. But like, what's the advantage? Why why want launch on Kickstarter? Yeah, it's a good question because I really went back and forth on it all the way up until the week we launched. Because all the books I've launched prior have been exactly what you're saying. Set up a landing page, put a Stripe Buy Now link, you know, and have a, have a few tiers, right? There's one with a video and one with a blog that's more expensive. And that's how I've always done it. This time around... There were a couple reasons. One, I really wanted to be able to offer a bunch of tiers, like seven different things. There's a live talk to Rob option. There's a, and that starts to feel weird on a landing page. But in Kickstarter, it's native. It was just really yeah. obvious that I could, because I, like, I don't do one-on-one consulting ever, right. right? one-on-one advising outside of Tiny Seed. But mm. I was able to offer, I don't know, I remember five, six, seven slots of that. Dude, you sold out. For hundreds of dollars, you sold out immediately. You should have charged thousands. I think I should have just offered more slots. but <laughs> So I really did want to have that option of just doing it, you know, of seeing what happened. The second thing was I like learning. I like doing new stuff that I've never done. And doing yet another launch to my email list, that's fine. I've done that a lot. But actually trying to do a Kickstarter, I was like, I don't know, what does this entail? How hard is it? What goes into it? You know, And the learning that I've had from that, I think has been really cool. So there's a bit of personal satisfaction there. The other reason is I've never had a hardback book. It's always been soft cover because hardbacks, you got to order a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, ship them over. You know, it's like a bunch of work. And, and oftentimes it's a four to six month delay. And so Kickstarter is kind of designed for that. It is a pre-order thing, right? I could have ordered two or three thousand books and paid for them, but I didn't want them sitting in my garage. So this is a way to, to do that. And lastly, 
I view Kickstarter as a community slash, it's not quite a social network, but it's a kind of, and I really wanted, I have exposure on Twitter. I have exposure in podcasts. You know, I have exposure on YouTube. I've never, I've backed 275 Kickstarters, but I've never run one on. Whoa. And I want, yeah, dude, go to my page. It's embarrassing. Good Lord. It is nerdy as hell though. It's all like, it's not video games. It's like tabletop gaming and like stuff I play with my kids. And, and there are certain slider belts and watches that I back too, but it's a lot of, of nerdy stuff. What's the, your favorite thing you bought on Kickstarter? Ooh, you know, there's a game. I think it was a kick. It was a crowdfunding. I'm not sure it was on Kickstarter, but it's a game called Kingdom Rush Rift in Time that is based on Kingdom Rush is like one of the, one of the best iPad games. And it is a tabletop version okay. of that with these, it's like 125 bucks when I backed it. And it's these great minis and. Oh, damn. Just, Endless. Not messing just, around. And my kid painted them. My 16-year-old painted them. And we've just had endless hours of fun playing with that one. That's awesome. You, you, have, you, have, you have kids that you can like uh, have an excuse for you to get those things. But I would just get them and just be a 36-year-old man. Totally. With tons of tabletop <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm so glad that th- it's like having kids is tough. But this is the best time was when my oldest. It's the excuse. Was, it's exactly. It's an excuse to like, I'm going to learn to play Dungeons and Dragons again. I hadn't played it since the 80s. I'm going to get into comic books and like Star Wars. stuff. So I would never make time for that stuff if i was i need a kid i need a kid for the sole purpose i i have like this omnidirectional virtual reality treadmill in my gym in the other room and whenever anyone sees it they go what the hell is that are (laughs) you an adult or are you not i just need just a kid that's just not even really my kid like a neighbor just to come and be like no 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 it's it's i got it for this kid it's it's like a charity thing it's not really you need a nephew or a niece yeah a nephew there you go that's awesome man i wonder thinking about kickstarter i wonder if there's like like if you look at our niche, like kind of like Andy Hackers, Bootstrap Founders, like there's not that many places where we launch products. You know, it's like Hacker News, Twitter, our own email list, Product Hunt. There's like only like a few. And I feel like that like that number hasn't changed in years. It's kind of just the same, you know, especially like if you want to launch to your customers, of course, there's like lots of different channels. Like some people are really good at SEO. Some are good on YouTube. Some are good on TikTok. But like internally, we want people on our own niche to support us. Like there's like those four places I feel like I'm blanking on any others. I wonder if there's like a, a room for another one, like an almost like like Channing. Maybe we should build this like a Kickstarter for Bootstrap founders. That's slightly different than Product Hunt. That has a different model, but something that people understand, so we can kind of like support each other and invest in each other's launches in a way that's easy. Yeah, and just have more surface area for like discovery for like the discovery function. Yeah, and I like this idea of like putting a credit card into it. Like one of the reasons why Kickstarter is good is because people like Rob, who've already backed hundreds of Kickstarters, when there's a new one, there's not all this friction of like, okay, I got to sign up and create another account and yet another website, et cetera. It's just like, boom, click a button, click pledge, already in there, payment's gone, and it's like super simple. I think that's a really intriguing idea. There's obviously all the logistics of like, well, what if they don't deliver and all the same crap Kickstarter has to deal with? But the idea of bringing it to our space, I think, is a, it's kind of a novel, novel way of thinking about it. I have to say, Rob, also the the idea of you going into Kickstarter is really smart, especially so we just had Wes Cowell on. Um, she runs Maven, the online course platform, and she had, had this idea where she's like, look, there's like a pyramid of ways that you can deliver content to your audience. And like the higher up the pyramid you go, the more high touch and like, you know, sort of profitable you can get. And obviously there's, there's higher stakes. And she placed a book sort of toward the top of the pyramid, you know, like the bottom is maybe like, you know, sending a quick tweet where you don't have to defend the things that you say. But then above book, she's like, it's like an online course, or, you know, you're actually live with your audience. And with your Kickstarter, you actually get to segment out like you don't just have to have this book that's, you know, something something you've already written, there's nothing you can really add, you get the the ability to have those tiers. So I really like that idea as well. You know, the the traditional, there was a microconf talk by Ryan Delk years ago, who used to work at Gumroad, and he had the whole, the typical launch for a book like this is you you have a 1x, 2.2x, and 5x price points. So if your 1x is 40 bucks, 2.2 is what, about 90-ish or 100, and then 5x is going to be around 200, and maybe do 250. And then you figure out what's worth 40 bucks, what's worth 100, and what's worth 200, right? And that is kind of how I approached it, but also I realized I don't, you know, I don't want to get on a, a one-on-one call for 200 bucks. Like my, I just can't justify that. So yeah, there's so there's an $800 tier, and then there there is a $5,000 tier to come for two days to Minneapolis this summer, right, and actually do an in-person thing, which I think in your pyramid would would just stack on top of that. You know, it'd just be up. I've never done one of those aside from microconf, so it's certainly going to be an adventure, but. 
are you open to like sharing how many people have taken you up on those offers? Like, how are we doing so far? So I had five slots and I think three are, are booked for five grand a piece, which would be great. I mean, anywhere between three and five is like a good number. I was, my fear was A would be zero or one. And it's like, uh-oh, <laughs> me and this person are just staring at each other for three days yeah. in Minneapolis. But Do you know who the backers are? Like who, who got those slots? Not yet. Ooh, total mystery. No, I don't mystery. think we learned. It, I know, it's a trip. And you know, what's funny is my brother who lives out in California sent me a text and he's like, hey man, if I bought back one of these in-person retreats, does that include a trip to Parlor Burger, which is like a famous Minneapolis place? And I was like, heck yes, it does. So I honestly don't know if <laughs> like it, one of them might be him. I have no idea. So <laughs> It could be us. It could be you. Here we are. It could be anyone. Yeah. I'll, know in a, I'll know in nine days, I guess. So let's talk about the book itself. You described it as kind of what to do once you have product market fit. And like, obviously you have like a, a pretty good perspective on this. You run Tiny Seed, you see dozens and dozens of companies that you work with personally every day to help them basically grow their startups. How do you figure out what goes into this book? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people listening, us included, who want to know, like, what do you do once you have a big audience and your product is like struck the market and you kind of have this elusive product market fit? What now? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a really good question. And it's one I'm, you know, I had only been through once or twice before running Tiny Seed. And I had been in conversations and affiliated with folks at MicroConf, but you're right, I'm really inside a bunch of businesses now. And so I'm seeing the patterns. The book really starts off talking about, hey, even if you have weaker product market fit, like here's how to think about talking to customers and strengthening that. And, you know, it's some stuff people have heard before. And it's also some of kind of my unique thinking. But then I really... I went through all the advice that I have emailed to founders. Post I, I every time I would post to indie hackers, I would take that post if it was a response to someone's question, and I was throwing it all this all in in a Google Doc. And I realized there were patterns. Right, talk about content reuse. Mm. There were patterns to what people were asking. Like, should I compete in a really competitive niche? Like, how do I compete with big competitors? That's a topic in the book. Right, pricing. That's like. The, the number two chapter after market is pricing because most founders screw it up, right? We underprice our product. And I talk through my psychology of pricing, how I see, what I see people doing well, what I see them doing poorly. And then, of course, marketing's a huge one. A little different for indie hackers because your community, much like MicroConf, like I don't necessarily think about marketing beyond the content we produce. But if you're a SaaS app, a B2B SaaS app, like the hardest thing is like, what do I do? What do I try? What do I try in what order, right? And that I have a whole chapter on that. Is uh, I have a three factor framework of like is speed, scalability, and cost. I think I forget what the third factor is, but it's a whole mental map that I've developed of like, hey, there are only about twenty B two B SaaS marketing approaches. These are the ones you should try in this order based on what you want to accomplish, right? So it's it's a, and then I talk about hiring, building your team, tracking metrics. That, I mean, that's kind of the high level. So I have a friend who's an investor who was telling me this sort of theory that it's it's basically becoming harder and harder to build a successful SaaS business. And his his idea is, here's why. There's more competition than ever. Ten years ago, not that many people were building SaaS businesses. Not that many people knew how to code. Tech startups seem like a difficult thing to bust into, especially if you're self-funded. Today, there are like dozens of businesses for every product idea. The playbook for starting SaaS businesses is out, right? You literally wrote the playbook. Other people have written the playbooks. Like People have mapped this out. And they kind of know how to attack a different distribution channel, et cetera. But he argues, even as there's more and more competition and more people starting things, the number of channels for marketing your your product is not really growing as quickly as the number of people who are trying to do this thing. So everything's becoming more competitive. Ads are becoming more expensive. The bar is getting higher and higher to do good SEO. Every company is inundated with sales calls because there's so many people doing sales. And your experience, is this true, is it getting harder to start a SaaS company? I would say yes, but it's not, it's not hopeless. Is it slightly harder than a few years ago? Yeah. I honestly think everything that you're saying is accurate. The content bar, especially with AI now, but even, bef- even before that, like 10, 15 years ago, I could hire someone to put out articles and just build links, like almost buy links from, what were they, blog networks or whatever, and you could rank in Google and you can't do that anymore, right? So it is more challenging. I do think that's where raising a bit of funding has become more and more in my head. Like, I think if you get traction, it's probably something you want to think about. You know, even if you're a hardcore bootstrapper like myself, it it just becomes hard to organically grow business in the ways that we used to. With that said, there's a flip side to this. We still see tons of companies apply to Tiny Seed that are competing in spaces where they're 
it's just the competition is much less, right? So like Builder Prime is a CRM for home improvement contractors. And when I first heard the idea, I was like, ooh, that's a tough market to sell into. How are you going to find them? And how are you going to close them? And you know, customer pain, right? Oh, non-technical and all this. And he's crushing it, just absolutely crushing it because he's executing really well. So it's the people, there are a lot of people starting, a lot of people trying things, but I still see Ruben Gomez with Signwell. I see Derek with Savvy Cal. You know, the, a lot of folks we know, and then a lot of folks you haven't heard of that are in Tiny Seed, like uh, Iran is the founder of gymdesk.com. And that's another one where it's like, well, aren't it's, it's like booking, scheduling software, management software for like a gym, martial arts studios, all that. Wouldn't you think that's a solved problem? And yet the dude is growing like crazy. And so, but it is, it, it, comes down to, yeah, you have to execute probably at a higher level than you did 10 years ago, but it's still completely possible. There also seems like there's a huge out of that of that challenge is finding a smaller niche and not just sticking with a market as it seems to declare itself to you at first. There's a really good anecdote about Gary V, who had some conference, he gave a talk somewhere and there were like 400 people at the conference and he goes, well, hey, listen, at the end of this conference, I'm going to give a one-on-one like, you know, one hour coaching session to somebody. And like, this is an auction for charity. The bid starts at $500, right? And at first, like all 400 people in the room were like, okay, well, you know, we're, we're bidding it up maybe, you know, $50 at a time. And then everyone started to kind of fall off except for two people, right? At the end, who were just like really, really wanted it, right? And they just kept you know, going up by $100 to the point where everyone was, was so restless that he was like, okay, well, you're both at 4,000. Would you both just like pay me 4,000 then I'll make it, you know, each of you get that. Can we just settle this, this here? And so in a way you could say, well, look, the market was everyone in the room, right? And like, you know, the, the supply and demand placed, you know, his little coaching session at whatever, $800. But really the market was two people. Right. At that price point. Yeah. You're right. At this at this new price point. And so I kind of feel like one easy way to to miss out is to go, oh, well, you know, sort of we can't build a SaaS in this space because it's so overcrowded. Because you're just looking at the at the at the market as it's been designated by everyone who's come before. I just recorded or I think I released a podcast episode this week about positioning. And I was talking about like positioning really is figuring out where there's a gap in the market. Where is the corner of the market between sometimes it's like, oh, there's there's tools out there, but they're too expensive and they're hard to use. Is there an opportunity for a drip or a convert kit to come in and kind of swoop in under, right? Mm. And, and we both got a lot of traction because of that. Or we see it with like another electronic signature tool. Isn't that a solved problem? And yet Signwell's crushing it, right? And right. there are reasons because he found out some unique angles, but also because he positioned himself well against the incumbents and people are a little tired of him, you know? So I agree with you. I think the other thing too is it is more competitive, but the markets are all growing. Like the market for email service providers compared to 10 years ago is gotta be two or three times what it is. So there are more customers in these spaces, even though the marketing is more competitive, the channels are competitive. But I think that's where people need to have some type of differentiation. The biggest mistake I see is someone building, trying to build the exact same thing as a bigger competitor. And they'll be like, well, the market's huge. I just need 1% of it. It's like, no, no one's going to sign up. You have to be opinionated and either have unique feature set or unique positioning and be like, we are really good for this subset and not good for everyone else, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. I watched your video on Kickstarter where you're sort of marketing the book and you go through like a list of like different things that are included. I want to talk about a few of them. You have mindset, you have product market fit, you have marketing, you have new ways to differentiate and compete. You just mentioned that last one, new ways to differentiate and compete. So how do you do that, right? You said have an opinion. You can't just be the same as the incumbent. What works in terms of differentiating yourself and what doesn't work? <laughs> Usually early on, everyone says, we're the simpler version of this. And that- We're that with no features. <laughs> it's kind of a cop out. Exactly. It's usually- We're the cheaper. Right. We're cheaper or simpler. And it's like, okay, may- maybe, maybe for now, but really that's not an, you know, a, a durable advantage. There's a couple angles, right? The one we most of us think of is a, to pick a vertical. Is to well, I'm going to be scheduling software for these types of for hair salons or for gyms instead of scheduling software for everyone. That's kind of the most obvious. There are a couple others that if you ha- if you're in a big space with kind of hated competitors, what you're trying to look for is where are their Achilles heels or where are their weaknesses. Okay, so. As we were building, I'm going to use Drip as an example, even though it's it's older, because I did exactly this. We were undifferentiated and we were plateaued. We did not have strong product market fit. 
And then what I found out was there these marketing automation providers were pretty expensive and they were hard to use and their sales process sucked. They made you go through multiple calls. They made you pay a $2,000 onboarding up front. A lot of them made you pay annually. And so I kept saying, is there a way to make not simpler software, but much easier to use software to remove that frustration? Is there a way to just have self-sign up if you want it? And is there a way to still be super profitable, but underprice them? Right. I'm not I'm not gonna be Walmart, not the low price leader, but they were charging outrageous. I mean, the cheapest one was four hundred dollars a month, and the most of them were two grand a month and up. And so how can we that this is a way to, to do it, is right? How can we take something that enterprises are using now and paying a lot of money for and make it more accessible to the masses? Right. So I think those are two. There's a couple other there's other tactics there, but and, and it sounds like if you reduce your operating expenses, so if you have like an option where you don't have to provide all of this onboarding, then that's a way where you can kind of build that into a lower price without cutting into your margins. Yep. And it's like, it also becomes, if you're competing against big hated competition, oftentimes their cost basis for everything, including their software, like they were not on AWS because they launched 15 years ago. You know, there's, there's just a lot of, I think a lot of opportunity there. What about mindset? This is a big topic that I think a lot of people underestimate when they first become founders. What have you seen that helps people have the right mindset to basically succeed with their business? I mean, there's a lot to it, right? It depends on your own psychology. Like some people like me are naturally more stress, stressed or anxious. Like when I was running my last startup, it was like, oh, I'm stressed. Everything's going to be a deal ender. And I had to learn to like not make speed bumps into roadblocks. So some folks need to hear that, that like, hey, is not going to end your business. Most things are not going to end your business. Take a deep breath. We're almost trained in life to go to school and then get a job and then you know go to well you go to school and go to college and get a job. And you're not faced with crises on a daily basis. But as a founder, you kind of are. And it's sometimes I find it's hard to pick which of these crises are catastrophic and which are just not that big of a deal, right? And so I think that's a big thing that I help founders with these days is I will do do a call with a tiny seed founder and just say, I know you're stressed and I can tell this is a big decision. Mm -hmm. You'll figure it out. Like, just know that you're going to figure this out. It'll work out. I think being able to roll with things that feel difficult, but actually realize that they're not business ending is a big one. Where's your mindset at nowadays? I mean, you, you've been in the game for 15, 20 years. You've got a million things going on. Do you ever get disillusioned? Do you ever, do you feel like you have more energy? Like, what are, how are you feeling? So I feel like I'm living my best life and it's because I'm working on what I want to do. If you look at what, I mean, and I've, I do not take that lightly. Like I worked hard to get here. I got a little lucky to get here, but like the best decision I made was after selling my last company was to take six months off and say, what do I really want to do? Because I do see entrepreneurs sell their businesses and then start another one and do the same thing. And they don't really want to do that. You know, it's, and that would have been a mistake. Like if I was running hardcore right now, pushing on a SaaS app, I would not be happy. It's just not what I want. I need to be doing at this stage and age and w- with the age of my kids. So for me, I looked back at like, what have I been doing for free forever? And it was writing about entrepreneurship and it was having a podcast about startups and it was writing books and it was starting a microconf, which made no money for several years. You know, it's like, I almost walked away from all that at one point, got a cash offer for microconf and I was like, oh, this is like 2018. I was like, oh, I could just walk away from all of it. And then I realized, what am I doing? That's like my legacy. That's what you love. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing. I mean, that was one of the reasons it was like, okay, well, what if I double? I did a what if, right? What if I double down on microconf? What if I double down on the podcast? What if I double down on all this stuff? And that's where Tiny Seed started percolating as I talked to people of like, yeah, could you run an accelerator for bootstrappers? And it's like, what would that look like, right? And that's, so I, I, feel, I feel great these days. Corlin, you just, uh, you just quote tweeted someone. So we, someone mentioned, and no hate on them, but they were like, look, now that Indie Hackers is independent again, you know, if I were C.S. Allen and Channing Allen, I would list, on, you know, list it on MicroConf or MicroAcquire MicroConf <laughs> and sell it again to someone else, this time for 10x. Could be a great success story. And Cortland, Cortland cheekily, Cortland cheekily uh, quote tweets this guy and goes, the best success story is finding work you enjoy for a lifetime. Even if you sell and get a big payday, what's next? You start experimenting and trying to build a life you enjoy, of course, right? That's always the end goal. Money is a tool for that and not a destination. And it's, in a sense, I think of two things that you just said, Rob, right? On the one hand, you had the experience or the privilege or whatever to take a step back, 
take a like not, you know a satellite view and say, well, what do I actually want before I just jump into something? But then the first piece, which is if you have a little bit of a temperament for being anxious and everything is a fire, well, when the house is on fire, you don't have to have time to like stop and navel gaze. And so putting those two things together, if you're able, and it's like, you know, the it's all in the how ultimately, but if you're able to like see a small fire raging, like a little bit of an ember and go like, all right, I could put that out, but like, I really need to like, think about what I'm going to do after this, you know, after I put this fire out and then I put the next fire out, how do I build a system, for example, where I'm not really dealing with fires? Like that's the really difficult balance to strike. That's right. And it's something I didn't do well until I left Rip, until Tiny Seed MicroConf. Like we have budget, but we all, I also have experience to like put the right people in place such that producer Xander runs MicroConf day to day, right? And yeah. Tracy Osborne does a lot of the running of, of Tiny Seed. And that allows me to work on exactly what I want to work on, which is not a luxury you have when you're bootstrapping a SaaS. You just have to do everything until you have money to hire it. And oftentimes that, you, if you're bootstrapping, you never have enough money to hire, which, which you really need. There's this, um, this, like, I would describe it as a scarcity mindset around coming up with ideas where a lot of founders, myself included, for the vast majority of the time I built stuff online, think that like, it's very hard to come up with an idea for something to work on that can both make money and that can align with things that you enjoy doing. And so you got to choose one or the other. And if you're a broke-ass founder, your first time out of the gate, you choose the one that makes money. And so you see a lot of people starting companies that they would never want to do a second time after they sell the first time. Do you think that that is kind of a true dichotomy? Do you think it's reasonable as a founder to think, okay, what am I going to enjoy running for the rest of my life and what will make money? Or do you think you kind of have to go out there, build something that's successful, and then once you've got your nest egg, then figure out what you want to do and build a company that aligns with what you want to do for the rest of your life? I think that you have to enjoy the process of building a business and you probably want to like your customers. But I don't like the mindset of I have to build something that I don't really like in order to make millions so that I can work on what I want, right? Because that's you got to enjoy the journey. But also the journey sometimes is not very fun. And so what are you going to hang on to during those not fun times when you're grinding it out or when Russian spammers get all your IPs blacklisted on a Sunday night <laughs> as happened to us in 2014 and I wake up and I'm like, well, guess we had a good run. We're done. This is, I literally was like, I think we're done. I think we're going to have to shut down. That's it. That's it. The company drip is no more. So like, do I love dealing with email deliverability and IPs and blacklists? And, is that your dream? No, don't. But I really love building businesses and thinking about them and solving hard problems creatively, right? Because that was what, there was constantly hard problems that we'd have to sit down and say, whether it's like, how do we get our IPs unblacklisted? Or it's, how do we build, like we have these 50 feature requests and they're all kind of related, but they're all asking for different things. Like, how do we turn this into a visual workflow that answers all of them, right? That was like a super hard, creative, almost engineering mindset problem to solve. That's the part that I enjoyed the most. And so I think that's what I'll say is like, I could have run a business for gyms, you know, or for hair salons or whatever. It's still creative problem solving. But I think the two things you want to, you want to love is like, building a business, creative problem solving, and your customers. Totally I think you want to, like, I do enjoy working with entrepreneurs, right? And it's like, if you don't want to deal with hair salon owners, then don't start don't start a business for them because Patrick McKenzie talks about this, right? With appointment reminder. And bingo card creator. And bingo card where it's like, ugh, he did it for the money and he, he learned a lot, but as he quickly learned, like, I don't think this is the, these are not the people I want to talk with every day. I think that's something that a lot of people, you know, make a mistake around. There's this book, Channing, remember you recommended to me from strength to strength? Yeah. And it kind of it kind of starts off by saying, like, look, if you're reading this book, you have made it. You know, you are at the top of your field in some area, you've been a success. Congratulations. But what do you do now? Right? This book is for people like you trying to find their second peak in life. And he studied all of these famous people from um, Charles Darwin to Johann Sebastian Bach, and kind of recognized a certain pattern that when people are younger and they're sort of getting their first success, that's when they seem to have the most energy to sort of grind it out and to do like this very hard, often like creative or even mathematical work to sort of figure it out, right? You're trying to figure out how do I combat spammers? How do I push into this new market? But once people get older, if they keep trying to do that same thing over and over, they tend to meet with less success. Like Charles Darwin, everybody knows him because he like, you know, created the theory of evolution. But like people don't know is that he like died 
tremendously unhappy because he kept trying to top that success when you come up with new theories that just no one ever really knew anything about and he sort of died alone and like unhappy <laughs> versus like others which is tragic i don't know why you're laughing because it's so but tragic i think that's common right but uh i think the more successful approach that he talks about is as we get older and we like have gained all these not knowledge from like our earlier wins is to move into a much more like social role a much more teaching role a much a role that like aligns with our strengths which as we get older is the fact that we have a ton of experience and wisdom and knowledge, much more than like anyone younger has because they just haven't been out there. Whereas at the same time, our brain power, you know, our horsepower is slowing down quite a little bit, you know, we're a little bit more resting on our laurels. And so like it's not surprising to me to see this transition of a lot of people who like do this crazy SaaS startup at first and they're fighting through all these thorny problems that aren't really their life dream. And then later on when they look back and see what they enjoy when they want to get started again, it's, you know, running conferences, doing one-on-ones and office hours and talking to people and just generally giving back and helping other people. And once you've sort of achieved that nest egg, like you also have the clout to do that and make money from it because people will pay you $5,000 to go on a retreat with you because you have those wins under your belt. Yeah, I'm really honestly impressed or surprised by the people who do just keep starting and starting. Like David Cancel's on his fifth, I think, company. And even like ADP and R did Woo themes, which became WooCommerce, and then did Conversio and sold that to campaign monitor and now is on like his third or fourth and he had a couple that failed and i'm like i respect that but i that's not me I, but I'm, I'm also a lot older than 80 i think so david cancel is just an anomaly to me i'm like this guy's <laughs> unbelievable but or even like i guess jason cohen had three and he had like a small success up front and then a bigger one and then wp engine has been the last 12 years so right but I, I couldn't see him doing another one after wp engine but maybe he maybe he would but i see exactly to your point i see a lot of entrepreneurs doing that. I mean, that, there's a reason the Tiny Seed mentors, the mentor list is a lot of founders who have exited because they want to participate and give back and still be in the game, so to speak. But they don't want to be the set. They know it's like, um, it's a cliche, but like, I'm too old for this. Shit. Like, that's how I feel, you know, of, of actually being in the heart of it. I've done it for too many years. And like, it doesn't sound fun. I could, could I do it? Could I pull it off? Yeah. Do I want to do that? No. And see, that's, that's the big, that's the big change. So what, the author of that book talks about is like, in the beginning, whatever, in your first 30, 40 years, you have a lot of fluid intelligence, you're really creative, it's easier for you to come up with the ideas. And then eventually you have crystallized intelligence. So it's easy for you just to kind of the wisdom that you've gained. But you seem I mean, you're you're saying for you, it's not that you couldn't, you're just like, nah, I've been there, done that. Or maybe I couldn't, and I just don't know it. I, mean, <laughs> I do know that like running Tiny Seed to MicroConf is still like when I first meet people and they say, "What do you do?" I, I say, "I'm a startup founder. I run startups." Like that's what Tiny Seed to MicroConf really are. Like Tiny Seed happens to have raised funding to invest in other startups, but internally we are still, you know, we have engines that we're building. We have marketing engines in MicroConf. It is different than running a SaaS, but it is still a lot of of problem solving. So. These days, I'm I'm curious about you. What what drives you? Are you are you driven by like making more money a lot? Is like is it is it just, just the sort of the process? Yeah, because I think everyone has like kind of their own formula for like what brings happiness, what motivates you, right? Like when I was younger, I was just like I wanted to be a success. Um, I think now we're sort of talking about like the second peak in your life, and it's like a lot more driven for most people by like what makes me happy. What's on what's on your checklist for what makes you happy? It's a really good question. And it's one that like I grew up my whole life wanting to be able to work on whatever I wanted. I wanted freedom, right? I never the money never mattered, but I needed money to be free in my day job. Right. I mean that's it's like a constraint, not a it goal. It is, exactly. And so my goal since I was like had my first job, you know, when I was a teenager was like, I want enough money that I never have to work again. That was it. And no, and I don't need more. Some people do need more and they're driven by the money. And I I haven't been. The money's nice. I have a you know, house, house in a car, and that's great. But I achieved that point in 2016, in essence, where it's like, okay, I literally never have to work again. Right. But I'm going to work. So what am I going to work on? Right. And that was the big kind of come to Jesus moment, so to speak, of like, I went on a founder retreat and was like, I think I'm going to step away from all this. And I actually started talking to the number two board game slash tabletop gaming website in the world in terms of traffic and reach. And I was going to acquire it from him. And I was like, how much revenue do you have? I was going to make, I was going to go all in on tabletop games and all this. And then I had that moment I talked about earlier where I was like, no, I mean, that's fine, but I'm going to regret this. If I do this, I'm going to, would you? Oh yeah. I would get into tabletop gaming and be happy for a couple of years. And then the margins are terrible. The, you know what I mean? (laughs) Money is still a scorecard. You know, it is, that's something I think is a, 
pro and a con or a strength and a weakness of me is that I have a tough time doing things that don't involve money, even though the money doesn't motivate me per se. But just doing things, even like my hobbies, I collect collectibles, right? I have this Beatles gold record back here and I bought it and it's worth more than it used to be. And it's like, I'm never going to sell it. So that doesn't matter. But somehow the money, like it is. Gives you a little, a little jolt. Yeah. I have to say, I feel that the fact that I want to write a novel, I'm, I'm working on a novel. And I feel like the fact that I'm trying to write a novel must mean by logical extension that I don't really care at all about the money. <laughs> but, totally. But the, but, the, but, the, but the thing about that though is, is one of my strongest convictions, I think that one of, the, one of the things that I root for for everyone is to get to a point where they make the amount of money where they don't have to think about money anymore. Not because, oh, cool, now you're going to have money. But it's like every single time I've seen someone have that transition, they then have to stop and say, okay, but what do I want for myself besides money? And it's like this self-realization that I feel like you can't ever have good clarity around that until you reach that goal. Yeah. And that's the thing is the people I know who are doing it for the money, when you get there and you make 10 million bucks, 15 million bucks, what next now? Are you just going to do it for more money? Because I don't know that you're going to be happy. You know, there's, I mean, I think probably all of us know deca millionaires who are really unhappy. That sucks to have worked all that time and to be a one, whatever, a one percenter or a three percenter, you know, some of the most wealthy people in the world have that luxury and yet still not be happy. Like, I think that's kind of a travesty. Yeah, I know on my checklist, one of the, I've got four or five, like, items on it that tell me, like, I'm going to like working on this. And one of them is that there, there has to be some number that goes up. I don't know why. I don't know where that comes from. It has to be, like, if I was a writer chanting, maybe it wouldn't be money. Maybe it'd be, like, the number of readers or copies sold or something. But, like, if there is no, like, cumulatively growing thing, then I just get this weird feeling in the back of my head that, like, I'm not really building anything. Like, what's the purpose? And so, like, money in a way, like, when it ceases to become, like, the primary motivator, it's no longer, like, I need more money to be free, it does become, like, this kind of scorecard. But like there's healthy and unhealthy ways for that to happen, I think. If it's, you know, like you're the Scrooge McDuck character and you're just collecting more and more money, but you're unhappy because you have no idea what you want to do with it, except put it in a room and like, you know, swim through your vault of gold coins, then like, yeah, it's like that's unhappy and that sucks. But if it's like, okay, well, this is like a way for me to measure my progress and feel good, like I'm accomplishing something, then I think it can be healthy. And then you can always spend your money to like do other things, right? Invest in other entrepreneurs, pay it forward, help out friends and family, et cetera, because it's not about like spending it on yourself that matters. It's just a sort of a motivational, motivational thing. Yeah. I think that's a big one. A number going up is something I think about a lot too. And this is going to sound maybe contrived or cheesy or whatever, but like when I, (laughs) I realized at a certain point, I really like making an impact. I really like impacting people. And the more people I can help or impact, the happier I am. And that's not just bull talk. Like if you look at my history, I grow the podcast so that more people, every time I get an email, that's like, thank you. Like I get these emails. It's like, you changed my life. I had no idea what I was doing. I built an MVP. I just sold it. Like there was a guy in Romania or somewhere, very low cost of living. Who's like, I just sold it for half a million dollars. I can almost live the rest of my life on that. And it was basically following your advice. I made no money off of, they, they, they've never come to a microconf. I don't care. I care that his life is better. And I, is that a bit of a luxury? Yeah, I have that. I don't need to make money off him, right? But that's where the the numbers that go up these days are YouTube subscribers or podcast subscribers. Like that's where I'm, if those are stagnant, I'm just like, who, so who am I helping then? Like what, what good is this? How am I making a difference in the world? Right. So, yeah. I wanted to ask you guys about the whole Stripe thing. Is it a weird transition to, to do this? Yeah. No, no, no. Let's talk about, we can talk about whatever yeah. you want. That's why I love interviewing another podcast. Because we can just turn the tables, yeah. Exactly. Well, I mean, so I listened to your last episode. I saw the announcement that your Indie Hackers is Indie again. I listened to your last episode. And I know you can't divulge details of the the deal, which I'm not going to ask about. But I totally get why you guys would do this. Because I would feel the same way, right? I know even no matter (laughs) how good the parent company is. Why would Stripe do this? That's the question, right? Why was, and, and I believe Stripe approached you about it. Yeah. So is it a focus thing? Like I have my own theory of like, well, you know, markets are going down. I know they took a haircut on valuation. Are they just trying to focus or what's, what's the logic there? I think it's, it's tricky to talk about. You were right. Yeah. <laughs> but I think at the end of the day, like, I know this also sounds cheesy, but like the people that Stripe are just really good. They are not very miserly. They're not like, penny pinching trying to save every nickel and dime and i think patrick in particular is pretty wise about like the overall sort of concept of like branding and reputation you know compared to other like big unicorn startups 
of its size. Stripe has remarkably small number of like bad press stories, et cetera. And like that's that's like deliberate. Big it time. comes from the top because everyone at Stripe is conscious of like making sure like we have what's called like the front page test, right? If what you're doing appeared on the front page of a magazine, how would you feel about it? for the company, right? And that takes precedent over, okay, how much money do we save this quarter or, or this half or something? And so I think for Patrick, he's just looking at indie hackers and looking at like who we are and what we're motivated by and how we feel. And a large part of it is like, hey, how do you, are you guys happy? You know, are you doing what you want to do? Do you still have the same fire? Do you still have the same drive? He's asked me that question every single year that we've been at Stripe. And I think you know we could have stayed Right, we could have just continued doing exactly what we were doing, and Chan and I had to also go back and do some soul searching and be like, "Well, like, are we happy? Would it be better if we owned any hackers? That was never an option before. What would we do in that case? And like, what would we need to feel like it was even a fair deal or like a good deal? Because any hackers burns through a lot of cash, right? I don't want to jump ship and then suddenly be like losing money every every month. And so I think it was just like a hodgepodge of just it was just convenient for both parties to figure out a good deal for that. And like here we are in this crazy situation where like we owned, you know, this time last month, zero percent of indie hackers. Right. And now we own way, way, way more than that. And it's just cool. It's cool to be here. But I was gonna say uh, an- another another thing from Stripe's incentive perspective just aligns with the weird circumstances around them acquiring us in the first place, which is that if we do what we are like, you know, if we inspire a lot of new entrepreneurs and we help to educate a lot of entrepreneurs to be more successful. That's a a common rising uh, waterline that lifts all the boats, right? And so that's what we were doing at Stripe. We weren't making a lot of revenue. And then, you know, it wasn't a financial acquisition where we were raising their bottom line in that way. Like if we are healthy and happy and like uh, uh, inspiring more entrepreneurs and like doing, doing what we are really like designed to do better, then that helps with what Stripe actually wants from us. So like us being cut loose, us being independent and like having the energy to go 100% on, on indie hackers like is directly in Stripe's interest. Yeah, that's a re- and that's a really mature way of thinking about it. And I would expect the Patrick or Stripe in general to think about it that way, right? It's a long-term way of thinking. It's as you said, I know they talk about ra- you know raising the GDP of the internet. And if you're able to do that better independently, as you, I was gonna say before you said it, of like I know Stripe's not making buckets of money off indie no, hackers. Like no. that's not <laughs> that was not the play. The play, as I saw it years ago, was hey, we want indie hackers to stay alive, and or I think at the time you were running ads, and I think Patrick was like, ah, it'll grow faster without ads. That was my mental model of why they acquired you. Is like they want microcom to exist, they want indie hackers to exist. I don't know if you guys were there at the microconf where I was either talking to Patrick or John Carlson on stage. And I said, raise your hand if, if you, you know, SaaS companies all abounding, right? And I raise your hand if you use Stripe. And it's, it's like 90% of the attend. Yeah, it was crazy, right? Yeah. Yep. And so it, it's, I totally get that it's, it's good for them. It's just such a mature, companies don't think that way. And that honestly is one of the reasons, like I have respect tons just loads like they run it. I, I have similar respect for like Ben Chestnut at MailChimp. Like there's only a handful, Darmash at HubSpot. Like there's a handful that I'm like, you are super legit and you are very wise and you make decisions that are very mature. Also, Cortland, do you remember? I think it literally was the week before Patrick reached out to you via email to ask about acquiring us. You and I were posting on the forum about new business model ideas we were thinking of. And one of those ideas, and this was like at the top of the forum, was Paygate Indie Hackers. I don't know what the name of the post was, but we were like, oh, okay, well, why don't we do like a membership thing? Right, Because we were just looking at revenue and a lot of our revenue ideas. You're on a community, you have to at least consider that. Yeah, like a lot of our really public-facing revenue ideas that we talked a lot about were like 100% going to limit the impact that we had. And probably be good for us in the bottom line. But like, yeah, if you're a Stripe and you're like, okay, well, this thing is really useful for us. All of those types of ideas are going to be good for them, maybe in the short term, but not, they're not going to help raise the GDP of the internet. When Patrick approached you about this and said, do you know, in essence, would you prefer to be independent? Did the two of you have any hesitations around that? Like, was it actually a decision or really? Oh, what were, what were the hesitations? Um... It's nice to get paid a steady paycheck every single week. <laughs> it's really nice. 
it's expensive to run indie hackers, right? Like we haven't been focused on cutting costs that much, nor have we been focused on generating revenue in six years. So like how are we going to turn that ship around? It's risky, right? What if indie hackers dies if it's an, you know on its own? There's just a lot of considerations. Also like, okay, like this is an inflection point. What's our opportunity cost, right? What if we just quit indie hackers and went and did something else? What if I became an investor? What if I decided to go start a different company? Like what would that look like, right? Is our heart really in it? I think it was a big one for me. You know, I think... To some degree, the answer is getting to be a little more leaning towards no for me. Like, I'm just not as passionate about this as I once was. I think the peak passion that I had was probably the very first year where it was like, hey, I have to make this work or I can't pay rent. And then the next year, it's like, hey, I just joined Stripe. Like, I want to, like, be a success and impress people. And those are the two years where indie hackers grew by far the most. And so the question was like, okay, well, like, if we are indie again, is that passion going to come back? Because if it doesn't, this is probably the wrong decision. And so it wasn't something we just decided overnight. Like it took us literally a month of talking and figuring out everything we wanted and opportunity cost before we decided we wanted to do this. And now we're still in the process of like, okay, what's next, right? Like by the end of this month, Channing and I were super excited. We're like, holy shit, this is going to be like, I feel energy like flowing into me that I haven't felt in a while. So now the question is like, what's next for indie hackers? What do we do? The sky's the limit. There's a million and one things that we could do to make money and also to to do what you're saying, to have a positive impact. And then like the third thing, which is to like enjoy our lives, right? To like wake up every day and be excited about what we're going to work on, which I think it's, it's not worth doing anything if I'm not excited to work on it at this point. Yeah, I have a mental model, but it's just borrowed from other things. Like Jeff Bezos has like the regret minimization framework when you come to a decision. Which am I going to regret least? In my head, it's usually... If I'm come to a hard decision, if I pick the the path that will let me either learn more or that's riskier within reason, not risky like putting my house on the line, but that is gonna that kind of scares the out of me. Those are the ones that I tend to lean towards. I, I wasn't able to do that in my twenties. I was too scared. And then as I matured, I was like, oh, risk actually brings fun. You know, it it brings a little right. a little bit of sca- stakes in there. Yeah. So I mean, the two of you as as founders as entrepreneurs. I feel like you would have regretted not not going independent. Oh, definitely. I just can't imagine definitely. not doing it. Even though it's scary and you have to work through it as an emotional process, it doesn't even seem like a decision to me. It's just a foregone conclusion that you would do this. Yeah, the risk point reminds me, uh, have you ever read uh, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield? Yep. Yeah, like in his way of seeing the world, if you look at something and you're terrified of it, you almost should just assume like, I need to go do that thing, like because I'm terrified. Obviously, this doesn't apply to all things. It, it typically applies to, you know, you clearly say like this is something. This is a way that I want to express myself, whether it's through writing something or creating something. Like Cortland said, I don't think that there was an option where we didn't go and do something that, in a sense, kind of scared us. It was like, do we want to do it with indie hackers? Is this the best platform? And ultimately, I think, ultimately, I think, I mean, obviously, the answer ended up being yes, which I kind of want to now leverage the fact that you just wrote a book called The SaaS Playbook. You obviously, it sounds like you heard our uh, last episode where we kind of talked about some of our ideas, but we have a lot of ideas. And I feel like we'd be remiss to not try to use you to like give us a thumbs up or thumbs down on some of those ideas. Um, Corlin, do you have that list up? Well, well, I'm curious off the top of your head, Rob, like what would you do in our situation? Or what do you, what do you want to see us do if anything? Hmm. Oh, that's so interesting. What's interesting because running micro, like microconf and indie hackers are very similar, and so, but I, but I see, I've seen indie hackers as definitely more early stages, maybe not right, but it's definitely folks who might maybe want to work on multiple projects at once, or you know, yeah, there, there's a tie in there. I'm not sure I have an idea off the top of my head of like where I think indie hackers should go, and there's a there's a big reason for that is while you're a community and microconf's a community you're different. You're like a social news site for bootstrappers. And I've never run one of those. So I actually don't know where I would take it aside from, I mean, we can come up with revenue ideas and all that stuff, but um, I liked your idea of the Uh Kickstarter (laughs) before the, uh, I think that's clever, but that's a, that's got to be on your longer term, right? You need a shorter term of like ads and or pay, pay gating, right? Yeah, right now it's ads. It's it's pay gating. We're thinking of almost like a sort of like indie hackers VIP, a little bit like Amazon Prime. You know, you like sign up for Amazon, you get Prime, and they just stuff a whole bunch of features into Prime that have like nothing to do with each other. Like, hey, do you want to stream videos? Do you want faster delivery? Like, none of these things are related, but like the more value they put in Prime, 
the more of a no-brainer it is to not only sign up but to like not churn. And I think running an online community, it kind of feels like, well, there's lots of different things you want to do. Like I want to have these new cool ND Hacker profile pages that people will actually link to on their Twitter. But is anybody going to pay for that? You know, And if they do, it's just going to be a super low price point. Well, if we stuff that into like a, some sort of ND Hackers Prime subscription, right, or we add like a few features, then it's gradually over time as we build more and more things, just makes that more and more valuable to opt into. And there's lots of different things we can build that are like just generally helpful for the community and impactful that don't have to on their own be this amazingly killer SaaS idea. And like that appeals to me a lot because I just want to build small things. I don't want to build some gigantic, hairy SaaS that's going to take like eight years. And you have a luxury of the community trust you. You have such a strong brand that people will, if you say, hey, this is what we're launching and we're going to keep building, it's going to be a bunch of people like myself who are going to throw their credit card in and be like, I'm sure they're going to deliver. Right. You know? yeah. So here, here's breaking news that it's, I, producer Xander is probably going to be mad at me for saying this, but this is already in the works for us, a microconf. We have microconf connect, right? Which is a Slack channel, has like 50, 100 founders and aspiring founders. We are going to be offering a premium paid version of that, which mm. is had just has a hand, you know, five or ten perks and premier access to microcom videos. And you know, you get all the you get a bunch of private channels in the Slack and whatever else. There's a whole list of it that I actually don't remember. So I mean if you're asking me what you would do, that's what I'm doing. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you're like you're like you're like, why yes, that is a good idea, Cortland. That's uh it's a no brainer to some degree. If you love MicroConf, you're totally. part of the community, you're going to go. Like, why wouldn't you pay like some small amount more to get all these extra features and things that allow you to not only support the community, but also like get access to more benefits? Right. And that's the same with indie hackers, right? And your yeah. community itself is much larger or a bit larger than ours. And I think you have, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer that you could make some money there. A little bit easier when you can add someone to, as a member of your community by them like clicking a few buttons on the internet than having them come all the way. So I've gotten some other like ideas on this list. One thing that a lot of people have asked me about is this idea of like, you know, we have this giant directory of products on ND Hackers, Rob. Mm-hmm. A lot of people have asked about ND Hackers investing in other ND Hackers. In fact, uh, Eric Tornberg DM'd me like three months ago. He started on deck, which is sort of this like, I don't know how to explain, like kind of a like school for people in the tech industry to sort of help each other with these different topics. And he's like, hey, why isn't there a way for people who love these small indie projects to basically support each other financially and invest in each other. And I'm not sure how it would work, but like, why haven't you figured that out? And it's been in the back of my mind for a long time, but I haven't just sat down and thought like, how would that work? And Rob, you're like the best person to talk to about this because like you actually invest in like quote unquote bootstrapped startups, right? Like you see like, what are the returns like? How does it actually work? And I think no one's really cracked this nut because like generally speaking, people invest in tech companies hoping for a unicorn. And the average indie hacker is not trying to make a unicorn, right? They're trying to like, pay their rent. And so something that I'm like noodling on is like, is there some way to financially, because like partly it's just like fun. If I could go to a giant directory of indie hackers and see all my favorite people building their stuff and I could throw money at them to help them be able to take off work and launch earlier, et cetera, and expect like not some huge return, but something that's just like, it makes it somewhat worthwhile. That would be dope. I'm not sure what the, the numbers are like for that though. Like, you know, realistically, is that even possible to get a return? Yeah, that's the complex. So there's two there's two complexities that I'm going to introduce. I love this idea as well because I would love to go to a directory of indie hacker projects or microconf projects and just be like hundred bucks, five hundred bucks, whatever. This is great. This is super fun. I think there's two things that are going to get in your way or going to make it complicated. Number one, return drivers making your money back will be very very difficult. Even if you if you go across all these indie hacker projects, as you said, people are trying to make their rent. Maybe they get to 20k or 30k. The money that's thrown off from there just it isn't a lot, right? So the valuations would have to be very, very, I'll say they'd have to be very reasonable compared. You know, it's like if you raise it a million dollar valuation and you put in a thousand dollars, you own one one thousandth of that company. <laughs> and so as you throw dividends off, like we can do quick math is nothing, right? So then it's like, so you can't raise it a million. So you got to raise at a, maybe a hundred thousand valuation. So then you put it, you know, and will people allow that, right? Will they say, I'll sell 20% of my indie hacker project for 20 grand. So that's one thing, like is to make the economics work, it will have to be different than, certainly than Silicon Valley, but even than like the tiny seeds and the indie.vcs, you would be at a, a, a level, I would say a level lower just in valuations in order to make the economics ever work. The other thing is on the, my God, the laws in this country, the securities <laughs> <Yeah>. laws. We, <laughs> 
we struggle so we spend so much money on law lo- on lawyers and we are literally lobbying congress to try to get the 99 investor mm. rule changed right mm-hmm. we we raised we raised a fund we can only have 99 investors they all have to be accredited they're already accredited there's are millionaires and yet i can't have more than 99 people in my fund it's ridiculous right yeah so we we're working with a group to try to get that change but all that said so we, in your case with indie hackers i think you'd want to go more the reg cf the crowdfunding route right because then you can just put in a few hundred bucks because if you were to try to raise from accredited investors a there's just only so many and b if you raise a thousand dollars from an accredited investor like the legal fees alone to just put that together are are cost prohibitive right so i think with crowdfunding i would then logistically like want to go out to one of the crowdfunding platforms and partner with them almost like you'd have a crowdfunding syndicate you know like a syndicate is you go on angel list right and and we run this we get a, a SaaS deal and they're outside of tiny seed but they're in the tiny seed syndicate and we can raise 100 grand 200 300 grand to help them kind of raise a, a round from our investors now in a syndicate they all have to be accredited and i don't know that's the best idea i don't know that that's the best option for indie hackers but i've never seen a crowdfunding syndicate and i don't know if that could exist because you don't want to you don't want to deal with the legal trust me it is mind boggling how it's expensive and time consuming and it's talk about stuff we don't want to deal with it's the worst you know it's like yeah it just seems like crowdfunding sidesteps so many of those issues like you 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 get to invest or you get I me mean, let's say you get to like you know let's call it invest but you're not necessarily only just buying equity right? Like you create, you allow for say the founder of a company to innovate what they want to give people such that maybe there are way easier returns. Like, Hey, you, you know, if you, if you invest this much money, like they can do like the tiers, right? Then you can be someone who has like a access to these features for my product, or you can, you know, you can, we'll always have you on this page who knows. Right. But there's, it just allows some for some benefit. That's not equity. Right. It just allows for some innovation on the, on the kinds of returns. And it's like, we talk about markets and like the personalities that go into markets. Well, it just so happens that if this happens on indie hackers, you're dealing with people on the supply and the demand side who are very like, have a lot of initiative, have a lot of creativity and have a lot of goodwill with with one another. So that's something that I'm I mean it's it's a really fascinating idea. If you remove equity it becomes a lot simpler. Exactly. And if you go to exactly. the more, you know, you talked about doing a crowdfunding model that is an equity, like more of a Kickstarter model built into indie hackers, right? Yeah. That's where you get yep. back to I could see people needing it would be a brand like you're the most famous indie hackers who what is like John Young Fook, right? He's big on the side. And I actually don't. Pete, is Peter Levels a big in Yeah, right? Peter's on there. But like, so if they came on and we're raising, a bunch of us would throw in money. I think people who, who have done less work and who have less of a following might struggle a bit more, but that would be the, that would kind of be the game, right? Yeah, that's the game. Can you discover the diamonds in the rough, right? Can you be, be there when no one else is? Anyway, Rob, thanks a ton. I appreciate your ideas and your feedback. Absolutely, sir. I feel like we can like work together in ways that we haven't been able to in the past, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, we just we're just in a whole different whole different playing field now, and so excited to go to MicroConf next year. Excited to stay in touch. Excited to talk to you about being an investor because I think I might be an investor going forward. Awesome. Try just did their tender offer, and so uh, my money is no longer just all on paper. I was gonna which is say, cool. yeah, now you're rolling. Yeah, That's great. yeah, yeah. So so life's exciting. I'm excited for your new book. I ordered. I think the option on Kickstarter to give me two hardcover copies so I can give cool. one away. And then I think the audiobook or the ebook. Uh, and then I'll probably buy whichever one I didn't get afterwards because I want every format possible. All the formats. Yeah. 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 What's your. And you know how I can tell that we're, we're beyond the Stripe Tinder offer? What? For once, you're not wearing your robe. You're wearing <laughs> a, an actual shirt. I can afford like, clothes. Or it, it's oh either it's either it's either the money, or you just have a lot of respect for Rob because you really you really dressed up. <laughs> he doesn't today. need to see my day. You have a whole T-shirt. <laughs> Got on. dressed up. I subjected West to, to my my robe look the other day. Epic. So Rob, you get to see me fully <laughs> clothed. <it. laughs> Thanks a ton for coming on, dude. Uh, uh, what's your what's your sort of parting advice for people listening who are you know trying to figure out what to do? Now that they've hit product market fit, this is sort of where your head's at nowadays. Um, Besides just buying your book, which of course they should go out and do, what's something you want founders to take away from your learnings? I think founders should, I mean, there are so many, right? But man, one thing I really regret is I didn't delegate more. Oh yeah. That I didn't hire more senior people. I hired a lot of junior people because I didn't have money. And I just, I was always the bottleneck, right? Managing junior people. And I think one thing that's on my mind these days is the luxury that I have. We talked about earlier of being able to work on what I want is because we have very senior people. And so the moment you can, 
hire someone who's really good, even if they're expensive, and that will allow you to 10x your business. Love it. Feels amazing hiring yep. somebody who's good, and then suddenly all this stuff is getting done, and it's getting done better than you would have done it, and you're just like, <gasps> it is. What it's is crazy? This? Yeah, it's nice. It's really a matter of inertia too. I say that uh, to go from zero to one as a founder, you have to learn how to wear all the hats, but to go from one to two, you have to learn how to take them off. And it's like really kind of a question of habit, but yeah, that's awesome advice. Where can people go to to find more about you? Uh, Startups with the rest of us. If they want to listen to podcasts or Twitter at Rob Walling. Boom. Startup Trust. I was highly recommend it. One of the longest running podcasts in the space. Super good. Rob's silky voice coming through every episode. <laughs> <laughs> like what you heard here. This is a three a three host episode. It really is. Well, and people listening to this on my feed, Startups for the Rest of Us, should go check out <laughs> IndieHackers.com. These gentlemen need some more signups so they can uh, get some ad revenue. Survive. Joking. And of course... The Indie Hackers podcast, which I'm I'm glad you're back because there were a few months there that were touching wow. the <laughs> and I was like, what's happening? They need to keep producing this. So. <laughs> All right. 